Diamonds by Russell H. Conwell, Part 10. 7. How a University was Founded. The story of the foundation and rise of Temple University is an extraordinary story. It is not only extraordinary, but inspiring. It is not only inspiring, but full of romance. For the university came out of nothing. Nothing but the need of a young man and the fact that he told the need to one who throughout his life felt the impulse to help anyone in need and has always obeyed the impulse. I asked Dr. Conwell at his home in the Berkshires to tell me himself just how the university began, and he said it began because it was needed and succeeded of the loyal work of the teachers. And when I asked for details, he was silent for a while, looking off into the brooding twilight as it lie over the waters and the trees and the hills, and then he said, it was all so simple, it came about so naturally. One evening, after a service, a young man of the congregation came to me, and I saw that he was disturbed about something. I had him sit down by me, and knew that in the few moments he would tell me what was troubling him. Dr. Conwell, he said abruptly, I earn but little money, and I see no immediate chance of earning more. I have to support not only myself, but my mother. It leaves me nothing at all. Yet my longing is to be a minister. It is my one ambition in life. Is there anything that I can do? Any man, I said to him, with the proper determination and ambition, can study sufficiently at night to win his desire. I have tried to think so, said he, but I have not been able to see anything clearly. I want to study, and I am ready to give every spare minute to it, but I don't know how to get at it. I thought a few minutes, and I looked at him. He was strong in his desire and in his ambition to fulfill it, strong enough physically and mentally for work of the body and of the mind, and he needed something more than generalizations of sympathy. Come to me one evening a week, and I will begin teaching you myself, I said and at least you will in that way make a beginning. And I named the evening. His face brightened, and he eagerly said that he would come and left me. But in a little while he came hurrying back and said, May I bring a friend with me, he said. I told him to bring as many as he wanted to, for more than one would be an advantage. And when the evening came, there were six friends with him, and that first evening I began to teach them the foundations of Latin. He stopped as if the story were over. He was looking out thoughtfully over the waning light, and I knew that his mind was busy in those days of the beginning of the institution he so loves, and whose continued success means so much to him. In a little while he went on. That was the beginning of it, and there was little more to tell. By the third evening, the number of pupils had increased to forty. Others joined in helping me, and a room was hired, then a little house, then a second house. From a few students and teachers, we became a college. After a while, our buildings went up on Broad Street alongside the Temple Church, and after another while, we became a university. From the first, our aim... I noticed how quickly it had become our instead of my. Our aim was to give an education to those who were unable to get it through the usual channels. And so that was really all there was to it. That was typical of Russell Conwell, to tell of brevity of what he has done, to point out the beginnings of something and quite omit to elaborate as to the results. And that when we come to know him is precisely what he means you to understand, that it is the beginning of anything that is important, and that if the thing is but earnestly begun, and you set it on the right way, it may just as easily develop the big results as little results. But his story was very far from being all there was to it. He had quite omitted to state the extraordinary fact that beginning with those seven pupils coming to his library in the evening in 1884, the Temple University has numbered up to the commencement time in 1950, 
88,821 students, nearly 100,000 students, and in the lifetime of the founder. Really, the magnitude of such a work cannot be exaggerated, nor the vast importance of it, when it is considered that most of those 88,000 students would not have received their education had it not been for Temple University. And it all came from the instant response of Russell Conwell to the immediate need presented by a young man without money. And there was something else I wanted to say, said Dr. Conwell unexpectedly. I want to say more fully than a mere casual word how nobly the work was taken up by volunteer helpers, professors from the University of Pennsylvania and teachers from the public schools and other local institutions gave freely of what time they could until the new venture was firmly on its way. I honor those who came so devotedly to help, and it should be remembered that in those early days the need was even greater than it would now appear, for there were no night schools or manual training schools. Since then, the city of Philadelphia has gone into such work, and as fast as it has taken up, certain branches the temple university has put its energy into the branches just higher and there seems no lessening of the need for it he added ponderingly no there is certainly no lessening of the need for it the figures of the annual catalog would alone show that as early as eighteen eighty seven just three years after the beginning the temple college as it was for the first time called issued its first catalog which set forth the stirring words that the intent of its foundation was to provide such instruction as shall best be adopted to the higher education of those who are compelled to labor at their trade while engaged in study, cultivate a taste for higher education and the most useful branches of learning, awaken the character of young laboring men and women a determined ambition to be useful to their fellow man. The college, the university, as it is in time came to be, early broadened its scope, but it was from the first continued to aim at the needs of those unable to secure education without such hope as, through its methods, it affords. It was chartered in 1888, at which time its numbers reached almost 600, and it has ever had such a constant flood of applicants. It is demonstrated, as Dr. Conwell put it, that those who work for a living have time for study, and he thought he does not himself add this, has given the opportunity. He feels a special pride to the features by which lectures and recitations are held at practically any hour, which best suits the convenience of the students. If any ten students join in a request for any hour from nine in the morning until ten at night, a class is arranged for them to meet that request. This involves the necessity for a much larger number of professors and teachers than otherwise would be necessary, but it is deemed a slight consideration in comparison with the immense good done by the meeting of the need of workers. Also, President Conwell, for of course he is the president of the university, is proud of the fact that the privilege of graduation depends entirely upon knowledge gained, that graduation does not depend on having listened to any set number of lectures or upon having attended for so many terms or years. If a student can do four years' work in two years or three years, he is encouraged to do it. If he cannot do it in four, he can have no diploma. Obviously, there is no place at Temple University for students who care for only a few years of leisured ease. It is a place for workers, and not of all of those who merely wish to be able to boast that they attended a university. The students have come largely from among the railroad clerk, bank clerks, bookkeepers, teachers, preachers, mechanics, salesmen, drug clerks, city and United States government employees, widows, nurses, housekeepers, brakemen, firemen, engineers, motormen, conductors, and shop hands. 
it was when the college became strong enough and sufficiently advanced in scholarship and standing, and broad enough in scope to win the name of university, that this title was officially granted to it by the state of Pennsylvania in 1907, and now its educational plan includes three distinct school systems. First, it offers a high school education to the student who has to quit the school after leaving the grammar school. Second, it offers a full college education with the branches taught at long-established high-grade colleges to the student who has quit on leaving the high school. Third, it offers further scientific or professional education to the college graduate who must go to work immediately on quitting college, but who wishes to take up some of the course, such as law, medicine, or engineering. Out of last year's enrollment of 3,654, it is interesting to notice that the law claimed 141, theology 182, medicine, pharmacy, and dentistry combined 357, civil engineering 37. Also, that the teacher's college with normal courses on such subjects as household arts and science, kindergarten work, and physical education took 174. And still more interesting in a way to see that 269 students were enrolled for the technical and vocational courses, such as cooking and dressmaking, millinery, manual crafts, school gardening, and storytelling. There were 511 in high school work and 243 in elementary education. There were 79 studying music and 68 studying to be trained nurses. There were 606 in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Department of Commercial Education. There were 987, for it is a university that offers both scholarship and practicality. Temple University is not in the least a charitable institution. Its fees are low, and its hours are for the convenience of the students themselves. But it is a place of absolute independence. It is indeed a place of far greater independence. So one of the professors pointed out, then are the great universities which receive millions and millions of money in private gifts and endowment. Temple University in its early years was solely in need of money, and often there were thrills of expectancy when some man of mighty wealth seemed on the point of giving, but not a single one ever did, and now the temple likes to feel that it is glad of it. The temple, to quote in its own words, is an institution for strong men and women who can labor with both mind and body, and the management is proud to be able to say, that although great numbers have come from distant places, not one of the many thousands ever failed to find an opportunity to support himself. Even in the early days when money was needed for the necessary buildings, the buildings of which Conwell dreamed and left the second-story doors in his church, the university, college as it was then called, had one devotion from those who knew that it was a place where neither time nor money was wasted, and where idleness was a crime, and in the donations for the work were many such items as $400 from factory workers who gave 50 cents each, or $2,000 from policemen who gave a dollar each. Within two to three years past, the state of Pennsylvania has begun giving it a large sum annually. And this state aid is public recognition of the Temple University as an institute of high public value, the state money invested in the brains and hearts of the ambitious. So eager is Dr. Conwell to place the opportunity of education before everyone that even his servants must go to school. He is not one of those who can see needs that are far away, but not those that are right at home. His belief in education and in the highest attainable education is profound, and it is not only on account of his abstract pleasure and value of education, but its power of increasing the actual earning power and thus making a worker of more value to both himself and the community. Many a men and women 
while continuing to work for some firm or factory, has taken temple technical courses, and thus fitted himself or herself for the advanced position with the same employer. The temple has known of many such who have won prominent advancement, and it knows of teachers, while continuing to teach, have fitted themselves through the temple courses for professorships. And it knows of many a case of the rise of the temple student that reads like an Arabian Nights fancy, of advance from bookkeeper to editor, from office boy to bank president, from kitchen maid to school principal, from street cleaner to mayor. The Temple University helps them that helps themselves. President Conwell told me personally of one case that especially interests him because it seemed to exhibit, in a special degree, the Temple possibilities. And it particularly interests me because it also showed in high degree the methods and personalities of Dr. Conwell himself. One day a young woman came to him and said she had earned only three dollars a week and she desired very much to make more. Can you tell me how to do it, she said. He liked her ambition and her directness, but there was something he felt doubtful about and that was that she looked too expensive for three dollars a week. Now, Dr. Conwell is a man you would never suspect of giving a thought to the hat of a man or woman. But as a matter of fact, there is very little that he does not see. But though that hat seemed too expensive for three dollars a week, Dr. Conwell is not a man who makes snap judgments harshly. And in particular, he would be the last man to turn away hastily one who sought him out for help. He never felt nor could possibly urge upon anyone contentment with the humble lot. He stands for advancement. He has no sympathy with that dictum of the smug that has come to us from a nation tight-bound for centuries by its gentry and aristocracy about being contented with the position in which God has placed you. For he points out that the Bible itself holds up advancement and success as things desirable. And as the young woman before him it developed, through discreet inquiry, filed by frank discussion of her case, that she had made the expensive-looking hat herself, whereupon not only did all of the doubtfulness and hesitation vanish, but he saw at once that she could better herself. He knew that a woman who could make a hat like that herself could make hats for other people, and so... Go into millinery as a business, he advised. Oh, if only I could, she exclaimed. But I know that I don't know enough. Take the millinery course in Temple University, he responded. She had not even heard of such a course, and when he went on to explain that she could take it and at the same time continue at her present work until the course was concluded, she was positively ecstatic. It was also unexpected, this opening of the view of a new and broader life. She was an unusual woman, concluded Dr. Conwell, and she worked with enthusiasm and tirelessness. She graduated, went to an upstate city that seemed to offer a good field, opened a millinery establishment there, and with her own name above the door, became prestigious was only a few years ago, and recently I had a letter from her telling me last year she netted a clear profit of $3,600. I remember a man himself of distinguished position saying of Dr. Conwell, it was difficult to speak in tempered language of what he has achieved, and that just expresses it. The temptation is to consistently use superlatives for superlatives fit. And, of course, he has succeeded for himself and succeeded marvelously in his rise from the Rocky Hill Farm. But he has done so vastly more than inspiring such hosts of others to succeed. A dreamer of dreams, a seer of visions, and what realizations have come. And it interested me profoundly not long ago when Dr. Conwell, talking of the university, unexpectedly remarked that he would like to see such institutions scattered throughout every state in the Union. He carried on at slight expense to the students and at hours 
to suit all sorts of working men and women. He added after a pause, and then abruptly, I should like to see the possibility of higher education offered to everyone in the United States who works for a living. There was something superb in this very imagining of such a nationwide system, but I did not ask whether or not he had planned any details of such an effort. I knew that thus far it might only be one of his dreams, but I also knew that his dreams had a way of becoming realities. I had a fleeting glimpse of his soaring vision. It was amazing to find a man of more than three score and ten thus dreaming of more worlds to conquer, and I thought what could the world have accomplished if Methuselah had been a Conwell, or far better, what wonders what could have been accomplished if Conwell could have been a Methuselah? He has all his life been a great traveler. He is a man who sees vividly and who can describe vividly. Yet often his letters, even from places of the most profound interest, are mostly concerned with affairs back home. It is not that he does not feel and feel intensely the interest of what he is visiting, but that his tremendous earnestness keeps him always concerned about his work at home. There could be no stronger example than what I noticed in the letter he wrote from Jerusalem. I am in Jerusalem, and here at Gethsemane, and at the tomb of Christ. Reading thus far, one expects that any man, and especially a minister, is sure to say something regarding the associations of the place and the effect of those associations on his mind. But Conwell is always the man who is different. And here at Gethsemane and at the tomb of Christ, I pray especially for the Temple University, that is Conwellian, that he founded a hospital, a work in itself great enough for even a great life, but it is among the most striking incidents of his career. And it came about through perfect naturalness, for he came to know through his pastoral work and through his growing acquaintance with the needs of the city that there was a vast amount of suffering and wretchedness and anguish because of the inability of the existing hospitals to care for all who needed care. There was so much sickness and suffering to be alleviated. There were so many deaths that could be prevented, so he decided to start another hospital. And like everything with him, the beginning was small. That cannot too strongly be set down as a way of this phenomenally successful organizer. Most men would have to wait until a big beginning could be made, and so would most likely never make a beginning at all. But Conwell's way is to dream of the future business, but be ready to begin at once, no matter how small or insignificant the beginning may seem to others. Two rented rooms, one nurse, one patient. That was the humble beginning in 1891 of what has developed into the Great Samaritan Hospital. In a year, there was an entire house fitted up with wards and operating room. Now it occupies several buildings, including and adjoining the first one, and a great new structure is planned. But even if it is, it has 170 beds, is fitted with all modern hospital appliances and has a large staff of physicians and the number of surgical operations performed there is very large. It is open to sufferers of any race or creed and the poor are never refused admission, the rule being that treatment is free for those who cannot pay but that such as can afford it shall pay according to their means. And the hospital has a kindly feature that endears it to patients and their relatives alike, and that is that, by Dr. Conwell's personal order, that it is not only the usual weekday hours for visiting, but also one evening a week and one Sunday afternoon. For otherwise, as he says, many would be unable to come, as they could not get away from their work. A little over eight years ago, another hospital was taken in charge, the Gerritsen, not founded by Conwell, this one, but acquired and promptly expanded in its usefulness. Both the Samaritan and the Gerritsen are part of Temple University. The Samaritan Hospital has treated since its foundation, up to the middle of 1915, 29,301 patients. The Gerritsen, in its shorter life, 5,923 including dispensary cases, as well as house patients. 
the two hospitals alone under the headship of president conwell have handled over four hundred thousand cases how conwell can possibly meet the multifarious designs upon his time is in itself a miracle he is the head of a great church he is the head of a university he is the head of the hospitals he is the head of everything with which he is associated and he is not only nominally but actively the head end of part ten